evening everybody hopefully you guys are all doing well and you can hear me loud and clear seems like i plagued with audio issues when we have this uh this stream last week i apologize i know the audio was a little little crappy so hopefully it's sounding a little bit better today i'm going to try to pay a little more attention to the chat and uh, hopefully you guys will let me know how it's all going inside there and that you can hear me loud and clear and all that good stuff so um, we do have our uh, Sporlin BQ TEV kit giveaway tonight, uh, right behind me, right there. We're going to be giving that away. So um, we're going to let a few people roll in here, let the number get up again before I... Uh, uh, sweet. Thanks, guys, for letting me know you could hear me. Okay. Um, yeah, we're going to let the, uh, the, the stream build some people and stuff, and then we'll do the giveaway. So um, I've pretty much got a timer set on my phone, and we'll do it in about 10 minutes or so, so... A um, couple videos that I uploaded this week. I had a couple bonus videos in there too, and uh, just kind of wanted to discuss them a little bit, kind of give you guys some feedback and get your thoughts and different things on that. Okay, so um, the one video was kind of controversial, and I think a few people misunderstood me about the die. I had posted something on Facebook, and then also went ahead and made a video out of it and posted it on uh, YouTube also about how I was a second opinion on a. Um, uh, on a walk-in uh, refrigeration leak where some evaporator coils had been condemned. And uh, the previous contractor did a great job condemning them. Um, but as you guys, if you watched the video, you guys saw that what they did, though, was they added dye to the system. So that way they could uh, find the leaks a little bit better, which um, I do carry a dye kit in my van. And I was very forthcoming and let everybody know that, you know, I have used dye before. I really, really don't like using it. I've used it two times in my career. Um, they were both kind of last case, uh, you know, scenarios and, you know, there was no other choices we had to do it. It was a multiplex system that had just tons of leaks and anyways, long story short. So I have used it before, but I did not put it in this walk-in system. Uh, I had noticed the, actually the customer told me that the previous company had just put dye in there and they showed them all the leaks. So I kind of had an idea when I went to go put my gauges on it and uh, brought out my UV light and was kind of, you know, I showed you guys in the video where I saw the leaks, but I thought it was really, really interesting that uh, my electronic leak detector and the big blue soap bubbles were picking up a leak that the dye would not show. Hey, Robbie, thank you so very much for that super chat, dude. That was really awesome. I really appreciate it. Every little bit helps, dude. So thanks a lot. Um, so yeah, I was kind of blown away that, uh, is there a flicker in the background? You know what it is? It's probably my, uh, my ceiling fan. Let me turn it off and see if it uh, makes the flicker go away. Hold on just a sec. Yeah, it's probably my ceiling fan that you're seeing, so it should slow down here in just a second. It's got a little bit of a delay. So um, so anyways, so uh, I was not the person that put the dye in that system, um, but what I did notice was that, you know, the leak detector was picking up a leak, and the... Uh, Big blue soap bubbles was picking up a micro leak, but the dye would not pick it up. So I thought that was really, really interesting. And that was kind of a great example that, you know, dye only works when refrigerant oil is leaking out. It doesn't work when just the refrigerant's leaking out. Now, in theory, there is oil in the refrigerant that's leaking out. But in that situation, we were getting leaks at the bottom of the coil and we were seeing the dye. But at the top of the evaporator coil, we weren't seeing the dye very much. So... You know, that's just one of those things. I, I called it a usage case for using big blue and an electronic versus using dye. So, you know, to each their own, some people like to use dye. Um, I'm not a fan of it because, and I've been educated more in the last five to six years about refrigeration oils and how the refrigeration system works. You know, there, there's times in the past that I would use like a flush in the system and different things. And I've since learned, you know, over the past couple, you know, few years that, you know, that stuff's not good for the system and it really breaks down the, the, the windings on the compressor and all kinds, you know, all these different contaminants that we put in the system to help us, they're not good essentially. Okay. So really the only thing in my opinion, okay, and I'm not criticizing anybody that doesn't do this, but in my opinion, the only thing that really belongs in that system is refrigerant and oil. And if we add these additives to the system, then, you know, we don't really know what's happening inside that system. So if at all possible, I really urge you guys not to add additives to the system, whether it be dye, whether it be, you know, um, leak sealants, you know, all that fancy stuff. You know, I, I really think it's a good idea if we don't um, add that stuff into the system. So, um, so um, 
the other thing I wanted to point out too was that uh, shame on the manufacturers, shame on the manufacturers of those products and shame on our supply houses for not properly educating us on this stuff. See, because for a long time, you know, we relied on the supply houses to tell us what was good and what was bad and what we should do and what we shouldn't do. And, you know, when we go to the supply house and they say, hey, yeah, this stuff is OEM safe. The OEMs recommend it. Well, that's kind of baloney because the OEMs don't recommend it. You know, if, if you pay attention to a lot of those things, they get one OEM. It doesn't say which OEM it was. You know, for all they know, it could have been OEM condenser fan motor manufacturer. And, you know, they say it's OEM approved and then they print that on their can, but they don't say which OEM approves it. Right. So, you know, shame on the supply houses and shame on the manufacturers for for the deceptive marketing and the pushing of those products and not telling us that they could potentially be bad for the system. You know, it wasn't until recently when we really, really started hearing. Um, I'm going to give a lot of credit to Mr. John Pastorello with Refrigeration Technologies because, you know, when Brian Orr started having him on his podcast and, you know, we were enlightened to to the things that we shouldn't be putting in the systems. OK. And yes, if we had listened to the refrigeration compressor manufacturers, you know, they would have told us a long time ago, don't use that stuff. But, you know, those guys, it's it's sometimes hard for the general technician to hear from the refrigeration manufacturers like Copeland and Tecumseh and all those different people. OK. And, you know, when when something like Brian released his podcast and it was, you know, just kind of blowing up and everybody was downloading it and they got to hear that stuff, you know, we really got to hear how bad that stuff is for the system. So, you know, things are changing. I think we're we're, we're changing the way that we look at things. And, um, you know, and I think it's it's bettering us as technicians. And you guys, again, I'm going to reiterate, you know, I have used dye, I've used it two times in my career. And, uh, you know, it's, I wasn't a fan of it. And it sucks because those systems are still out there operating. I will say, um, they've been operating for about four years. And we really haven't had any major repercussions because of it. But I still don't like it. I'm still afraid that it's going to cause some problems. Um, so, you know, to each their own, if you use it, you know, more power to you. If you don't, you know, I'm not going to knock you for doing it. I just, you know, I prefer not to. And I'm going to tell you the things that I don't like about it is, is I don't know what a die is going to do to the system. I don't know how it's going to harm it because it didn't come in there from the manufacturer. And, uh, you know, it, it gets all in my gauges. Excuse me. It gets all over my hands. It sprays everywhere. If you get blowback, especially if you're not using uh, ball valve hoses, and if you have, uh, you know, Schraders and you're pulling it off, you're going to get spray and it's going to get everywhere. And even the little, uh, the kits that come with the dye, uh, it comes with like a little spray to clean it up. It doesn't clean it up. It just makes a mess. So if you are going to use it, you know, again, I really would rather you not. But if you are going to use it, make sure you follow the instructions and don't overdo it. You don't need to add three capsules of it to a small system. Okay. You, you just need to add what they tell you to add just a little amount. But again, I, I'd rather you not. Okay. And the same thing goes for all these weird, funky additives that they make for the systems. And again, this is my opinion, guys. I'm not the end all be all. I'm not going to tell you guys how to do your job. Um, you guys got to make those decisions for yourself and you guys will suffer the repercussions good or bad. Um, you know, from using those products, you know, sometimes the customer may request it. Sometimes the customer um, I've, I have used it actually. Sometimes I've had the customer come to me and say, Hey, I don't want to change that evaporator coil. I want to put a leak sealer in there. And I tell them, you know, I had one customer that I told him, I really don't want to use that stuff. It's going to cause problems. And basically the customer was, was given the option to, uh, replace the evaporator coil. And they were like, we don't want to spend that much money. They just wanted us to add that leak sealant. And I wasn't, I wasn't happy about it. Um, you know, I'm going to be honest with you. I actually sold them a set of gauges when I put that leak sealant in there too. I just had a cheapy set of, uh, uh, analog gauges sitting around the shop. And I, I added some money for those gauges cause I didn't want that stuff in my, my expensive digital gauges, you know? So sometimes the customers request it. Sometimes you got to do what you got to do. So, all right. Um, I want to look at the chat here and see what I'm missing, uh, and see if I'm missing anything in here so far. Let me see. Yeah, I see you guys say you hate the uh, the dyes. You know, it is what it is. So, and see what else. Um, uh, do I think, given enough time, the dye would have showed up? No, because if you, well, I mean, I don't know. That I think, from my understanding, what the customer 
had told me the previous company, it had been like two weeks. So the dye was showing up in multiple leaks, but it wasn't showing up in that one in the video on the top of the coil. So, you know, um, yeah, really, yeah. Refrigerant really is, uh, the only thing that really needs to be in the system, refrigerant and oil. So, um, okay. I'm just kind of going through here and seeing what I'm missing. I, I find myself missing a lot of stuff in the chat. So I just want to kind of pay attention to, um, Justin P. Hey, you love the dedicate, uh, the winter charge explanation video. Um, cool. I really appreciate that guys. Uh, Justin. So let's, let's kind of segue into that. So the video that I released this morning was basically a walkthrough of using the Sporlin 90-30-1 method of calculating the proper winter charge for a, uh, a system that was equipped with a head pressure control valve. Okay. So a couple things I want to reiterate, and I did get some comments about this and I want to make sure that you guys understand the number one thing, the Sporlin method outlined in the 90-30-1, which is actually this Sporlin bulletin. You can download it on Sporlin's website, 90-30-1. Okay. This, this method only applies to tube and fin condensers. So what that means is, is you cannot use that method for a microchannel condenser. So if you're working on a new heat craft system with the hypercore microchannel condenser, the Sporlin 90-30-1 method will not work. Okay. There's uh, two ways you can do it as far as I know with the spoil with the uh, the heat craft condensers with the microchannel. The first thing I say is you need to lean on the manufacturers. Whoever makes the condensing unit, you need to ask them their methods for adding the winter charge to the system. Now, um, I've been doing a lot of heat craft condensing units lately, and I call tech support just to kind of run things by them and ask them what they feel and how they want to do things. And I've been told multiple times that um, even though in the heat craft installation manual for the condensing units, there is something in there. It tells you an amount for a winter charge. They say that they've had a lot of problems using those numbers that are in the books. And what they highly recommend that you do on the heat craft condensing units is just put the maximum, uh, refrigerant charge in that system. And so basically they list them in their installation manuals. Um, and they list them in the, uh, the product information for their condensed units, they tell you the maximum pump down amount that can be stored in that receiver. And usually it fills up the receiver to like 80%. Okay. And that's what Heatcraft actually recommends that you do is charge to the maximum filled amount. So that's on a micro channel condenser. But again, you want to uh, talk to Heatcraft and or, or whoever the manufacturer of the condensed unit is and ask them their methods. Okay. Now, any way that you do it, even in my video that I just released where I showed the Sporlin 90-30-1 method, okay, what I highly suggest is once you've calculated that amount, and the same thing goes with the heat craft condensing units, once you've weighed in the maximum charge in those things, what I strongly suggest you guys do is mark the receiver's liquid level with a paint marker, okay? I keep paint markers in my bag, pump the system down, take your heat producing device. Again, I'm not going to tell you what to use, but you guys get the drift, Okay. Take your heat producing device. Make sure that you don't put the heat producing device over the soft plug or anything that can be damaged. Maybe two passes, maybe three passes up and down the receiver. Then take the back of your hand starting at the bottom of the receiver, and this is all while it's pumped down, and start running your hand up the receiver, and you will feel the liquid level because the moment you get to a burning hot point on that uh, receiver is the point at which you're not feeling liquid anymore and you're feeling vapor, okay? And that tells you the liquid level. So if you weight in the maximum charge, Mark that level for the next guy. So that way, if yourself or someone else comes to work on that system and you, you think it might be low on charge, you can add charge and you can just fill it up till that, uh, that paint marker level. And then you know you have the factory charge back in that system or the maximum amount or the proper amount, I should say. So um, that's my suggestion on that. So, okay. Um, and, you know, I've gotten a lot of comments from people too. Like it'd be really cool, but on the small stuff that I work on, they don't add sight glasses to the receivers. Now, I have heard that on the big giant industrial and the supermarket systems that sometimes they do have sight glasses in the receiver. So you can actually fill them up to whatever mark in the receiver and then you know, okay? And I've said this before, a long time ago, I used to work on Vote ice machines. And the Vote ice machines used to have a sight glass that ran up and down the receiver and it was really cool because you could pump it down and you could see it was a giant glass sight glass. And I think I've told you guys about it before. It kind of looked like the sight glass on this dial of charge that's right back here. Long cylinder running up and down the receiver, and you used to be able to fill the liquid level up and just see it right in there, and then that would help you too. So, okay. I um, want to get into 
some of these questions in here and see what you guys are posting in here. And uh, I say we give it a few more minutes and then we'll go ahead and do this giveaway too. So that way you guys that came in just for that, you guys can listen to that. And we got some more educational stuff to talk about after that too. So, all right. Um, now, uh, real quick before I go too far, let's cover for, for the, the basics what the head pressure control valve does. Okay, I've, I've done videos on this before. I've showed videos and I've showed you the temperature differences across the head pressure control valve, but in its simplest form, the head pressure control valve, the easiest explanation I can give you is it simulates blocking off the condenser. Okay, there's a lot more to it, but it's a valve that simulates blocking off the condenser. So if you have a refrigeration system, an air conditioner or anything, and you block off the condenser while it's running, the head pressure is gonna go up, right? So this valve essentially brings the head pressure in the system up. Now, there's a lot more to it, okay? The main purpose of the valve is actually to help maintain a pressure drop or pressure differential across the expansion valve, okay? Because you have to have so much force pushing on one side of the expansion valve to push the refrigerant at the right velocity through the expansion valve, okay? So as your ambient temperatures outside drop really low, so does your head pressure, right? So when your head pressure drops, okay, then that pressure drop across that expansion valve gets lower and lower, and then the valve starts to act erratically, okay? We don't have this problem so much. We're not so concerned about the pressure differential with newer expansion valves, but especially we're not so concerned about it with an electronic expansion valve, okay? Because electronic expansion valves, they can operate at a really low pressure differential, all right? Because they're not using mechanical parts inside the valve to help the valve operate properly per se, okay? Like a thermostatic expansion valve is, all right? Um, hopefully your eyes aren't glazing over in your head right there when I'm talking about that, but these things, they really do matter. Okay. So it's very interesting because I was just explaining to, um, someone that's working with me and still learning right now, you know, the, the, the very small window that refrigeration systems operate in. Okay. And essentially, you know, in a perfect world, you want your ambient temperatures to be between 70 and about 90 degrees. Between 70 and 90 degrees is like the perfect operating temperatures for a refrigeration system to work without having to, you know, add subcoolers and uh, um, head pressure control valves and different things into the system. Once you start getting below 70 degrees ambient, then your liquid uh, temperature drops and you tend to have pressure drop problems. And then once you get above like the 90, 95 degree range, then your, your efficiency starts to fall off the map because the uh, liquid saturation temperature, the condensing temperature inside the system gets too high. So it is kind of interesting that refrigeration only works within that small window perfectly. Now, you know, one could argue that, you know, you can bring outdoor ambient down to 60 degrees without anything and, and vice versa. You can go up a little bit higher too. But, you know, for the system to work perfectly, it needs to be within that 70 to 90 degree window, you know, somewhere in there. So it's very interesting how that works. Prime time, you and the headmaster valves, man. Hey, if they banned headmaster valves, then we wouldn't have cool things to diagnose and we wouldn't have to go out and adjust the charge and you know all that fun stuff. So it keeps us busy, right? Hey, that's 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 my opinion on it. All right, looking at the chat here, seeing what I'm missing, guys. Why don't I think we got enough people going on in here? Can anybody in the chat right now tell me what the uh the view count is right now. How many people are watching this at this point? So I don't have to change windows. Someone tell me in the chat and I'll get an idea. I think I guess I can pull it up. I guess I'm not that slow. It'll take me a minute though. Anybody? Anybody see it in the chat? How many people are watching the stream right now? Let's see. Okay, I'm looking up here to see what other questions I have. Um, Okay, 115. Okay, so yeah, I think we're good right now. We're going to go ahead and announce the winner of the Sporlin uh, BQTEV kit, okay? So what I'm going to do is you guys are going to hear my audio, but I'm going to show you, I'm going to share my screen with you guys so that way you guys can uh, can see who the winners are. So let me put this right here and let me go ahead and um, display capture, transition. All right. So I used a, uh, thank you very much, Ralph. I really appreciate that, bud. Okay, um, I, I used a app called King Sumo, and that basically helped me do the giveaway, guys. And what King Sumo does is it basically just keeps track of all the numbers and helps me to count all the different bonus entries and different things because with the amount of entries that I had in this, there's no way I could have done this just by emails, okay? 
um, your guys' emails that you entered into this, I'm not doing anything with those. I'm not selling them to anybody. They're not going anywhere. Okay, so don't worry about the emails that you gave. I'm not going to play with those or anything like that, all right? So um, what we have here is this tells us that we had 697 contestants, okay? And out of those 697 contestants, we had 9,212 entries. So that's basically all the bonus entries. And, uh, you know, by liking, sharing, all that good stuff, okay? So out of that right here, uh, it says status and awarded. Once I click on this, it's going to show the winner's email. Um, you don't have to be in here to, to, to win this. I didn't make that any part of the rules, okay? Um, so we're going to go ahead and announce it right now. I'm going to click awarded. And it says that the winner of the Spoiling BQTEV kit, well, your email, uh, it's ryan at grantmechanical585.com. So uh, you are the winner, Ryan. I'm assuming your name is Ryan. Um, so if you reach out to me or I'll send you an email, okay, uh, let me know if you are inside the chat. I just out of curiosity want to know if you're in the chat. But um, to everybody else that entered, don't worry, there's going to be plenty more giveaways coming, okay? So uh, thank you guys so very much. I'm not ending the stream either, okay? But thank you guys so very much for entering the giveaway. Um, I, I wanted to do this for you guys, okay? So um, I'm going to put this in here real quick, okay? So that's Ryan at Grant Mechanical. You were the winner, okay? So congrats to Ryan. I'm going to go ahead and transition back into um, the... Uh, if I can figure out how to do this here. Let's see, video capture device. And, oh, this is how I do it. So display capture, turn that off, transition back. Okay, I'm back. So um, yeah, congrats to Ryan. Uh, and uh, thank you everybody for entering the kit. You guys, one thing I gotta say is, no, it's Ryan. <laughs> one thing I gotta say is thank you so very much to Sporlin. Okay, so guys, here's the deal. I At this point in time, I'm not affiliated with Sporlin. They're not paying me nothing, okay? I'm not saying that's never going to happen in the future someday, hopefully, in perfect world, cross my fingers, but that's not what's going on here, okay? I had an idea. I reached out to Sporlin, and I said, hey, I want to do a video on my BQ TEV kit, and I wanted to know if they wanted to work with me, and Sporlin was totally ecstatic about it because the whole point of this giveaway for them, for me, I wanted to give one of these kits away to you guys, okay? But for them, uh, they just wanted to raise awareness about the BQT EV kit, all right? They've had this kit out there forever, for, I, I'm, I, I don't even know how long. I mean, it's been there for a long time, okay? My whole career, we've had one of these in our trucks. I think that the awareness of the kit has really, really gone down, and I don't think many people realize how easy it is to keep excuse me, that kit in your truck and be able to stock all those expansion valves. So thank you so very much to the guys at Sporland that took a gamble on sending me this kit. Uh, I really appreciate you guys and all you guys that entered the contest. Thank you so very much for doing all the bonus stuff because I really wanted to show Sporland what uh, the community that watches these videos could do uh, to their social media and to their YouTube page and to their podcast. And I wanted to raise awareness to the stuff that they have out there. Okay, guys, because there is a lot of great information out there. So Thanks again to Sporlin for sending that out. And Ryan, uh, we will get this sent out to you, bud. Okay, so I don't, I don't see you in here, but uh, good luck. All right, um, let's go to some of these questions in here, okay? And uh, we'll, we'll try to do more of these giveaways, like I said, guys. Anybody, you know, anybody that wants to work with me, I'll try to work with them. So, <laughs> there you go, Superior. All right. Uh, what's my favorite electronic leak detector? I have some other things I'm going to cover on my paper, but I'm going to cover some of these questions first. Okay, so the electronic leak detector that I use and uh, is the uh, DTEC Select. Uh, I've used it for a very, very long time. It does really well for me. Uh, so that's just been my leak detector of choice. I've probably used it for at least the last five years, and they've lasted a long time. The only thing you got to do is change the uh, the the sensor on it, which isn't the tip. It's actually inside the leak detector. So I've done really good with those and they've worked really well for me. So, all right. Um, thank you so very much for the super chat count sense count senseless. Okay, cool. Sorry. I could, it took me a minute to write that. I really appreciate it, bud. Um, Ryan Tanner, any business advice and guys, if I miss your questions, write them again. Okay. I'm not going to like go up through the whole chat. So it, you're not going to piss me off by rewriting your question. Okay. 
So if I missed your question, try putting it in caps lock or something, okay? So that way I don't miss it. So Ryan Tanner, you said, any business advice on changing new walking equipment, markups, labor hours, pitfalls? Um, hmm, that's an interesting one. I've been doing a lot of walk-in change-outs lately. And unfortunately, um, a lot of the customers, because I work with chain restaurants, they haven't allowed me to sell them the equipment. So they've been buying the equipment and I've just been selling them labor and like line sets and disconnects and all the little stuff. Um, so when I, I, I do quite a bit of them lately, there's a couple, of, I, I do at least two, two a month walk-in installs and that's just like retrofits, changing evaporators and condensers. Um, so you know, it's, it's just about getting a routine and trying to plan ahead for your jobs. Okay. Everybody getting to the job and trying to figure out what's going to happen. That's when you start tripping over things and things tend to take a long time. Uh, I prefer to do installs with, uh, my benders and a soft, uh, line set for the most part. Um, unless I have to do really long runs that I want to look straight on the roof. I find that using my benders and a swaging tool speeds up time dramatically instead of doing braze joints. So plus, Using benders is a lot less, um, uh, you know, there's a lot less pressure drop across the fittings when you're, when you're brazing on a 90 versus bending a 90. Um, you know, there's a lot less issues inside that and there's less for potential leaks, right? So, uh, yeah, that, that, that's some of the advice. Um, I would highly suggest that you email me a little bit more about that and maybe we could talk some more, uh, kind of off the top of my head. That's, that's all I got. As far as markups and stuff, I'd rather not discuss that in the, uh, the live stream, but send me an email. We could talk about it a little bit more. So, um, Bill Burnett, just the tip. Yeah. Watch out for the tip, but that's just the tip can get you in trouble there sometimes. So, you know, because if you accidentally submerge the tip in water, it can make the leak detector get an inaccurate in because I know that's what you meant, right? You were talking about accidentally getting the leak detector tip in water, right, Bill? All right. Um, haha. <laughs> thank you very much, Susie. That's, that's really cool. I appreciate it. Okay, so uh, interesting prime time. Yeah, those are interesting numbers. So interesting numbers. Okay, Ralph, you said, why are some reach and, frig reach and refrigerators have 35 degree air temps and keep product at same temp and some other brands need to have 30 degree return air to keep product at 35 degree temp? I don't know about that one, Ralph. I mean, typically most refrigerators are going to be, uh, Jordan, don't let me miss that question, but I have, a, I have an answer for that. Um, so Ralph, most, uh, refrigerators are going to have typically about a mm, 20 to 25 degree, um, evaporator TD on them. Okay. So that means that, you know, the, the evaporator coil temperature needs to be 20 to 25 degrees below the box temp to maintain the temp. Okay. Um, if you're running your box temp down into the thirties, that evaporator temperature is getting really, really cold. And you're typically going to have to have like an electronic defrost on the system. Okay. Um, so, you know, I guess we would have Ralph, we would have to talk about some, uh, certain situations. I'd need more details to talk a little bit more about that. But for the most part, a refrigerator is going to have a cut in temperature, you know, somewhere in the 38, 39 range. And so the theory is, is that it might melt any of the frost that builds up on the coil. Uh, but to maintain a 30 degree box temp, that, that refrigerator, I think you might be mixing something up there or something, dude, because, uh, unless it's like a custom special refrigerator, I, I, I don't know of any that are maintaining 30 degree box temp. So, okay. Um, all right, keep going. If I don't get, okay. So yeah, there you go, Bill. See, see, we we're thinking alike, right, Bill? All right. Um, yes. In my opinion, superior again, not knocking anybody, but in my opinion, uh, Sporlin does make the best filter dryers. And, and it's kind of funny because my supply houses know me very well. I frequent two sub two different supply house chains. Um, and they know me really well and they know not to give me, you know, when I call and say, Hey, give me a dryer condensed unit and all this, they know not to give me, um, Emerson stuff or Alco, the old brand. I typically like to use Sporlin a personal preference. Okay. I like their stuff. Um, I like the quality of it. Uh, I like the sight glasses, different stuff like that. So I'm a Sporlin fan already. So, um, yeah, just a personal preference. You know, I'm a, when I'm using thermal, uh, expansion valves and different things, I typically tend to prefer Sporlin. Uh, some of the old Emerson or Alco valves, you know, they didn't have power heads on them. And when the power head went bad, you had to change the whole valve. It's just kind of a pain in the butt. So I really, really do appreciate Sporlin products. And, uh, you know, that's just my preference. So, um, okay. I'm looking at this. So Susie, you said, so if you're using 
T to cause, and you're looking to purchase a micron gauge, would you stick with Testo? Susie, I'm a fan of the um, AccuTools Blueback micron gauges. Uh, I honestly have no opinion about the Testo stuff. I've never had anything Testo. Um, hey, Zach, thank you so much, bud. I really appreciate it. Uh, the Testo stuff, just it, personal preference. Again, not, not knocking Testo, okay, because a lot of guys love their stuff. It's just to each their own. I like the AccuTools Blueback. Uh, micron gauges. Um, you know, I'm a field piece fanboy, but I'm not using their micron gauge. So, you know, I, I'm not, I, I don't owe my allegiance to one particular manufacturer. I, I basically stick with what I like. So I'm using an AccuTools leak detect or a uh, AccuTools micron gauge, you know, field piece gauges, all that different stuff. All right. So P traps. So Thanasis, Thanasis wants to know if I want to talk about P traps. So Thanasis, are we talking about uh, drain line P-traps? Are we talking about refrigeration like suction line P-traps? Give me some context there and I can answer that a little bit better. Yeah. Okay, so. Primetime. I, I think I watched, didn't I watch... Did you make a video on that or who, who made a video on that where the Sporlin 163 filter dryer failed and something broke? Yeah, that was you. Wasn't it primetime? I, I think I watched a video where you made that and you or was it a Facebook post or something? I swear I remember that where there was wasn't it a biflow dryer or something like that? And the like little check valve broke off inside and blocked off the dryer. I think that was you. All right. Um, I'm reading the chat here. Oh, so someone asked me earlier what the oldest refrigeration system that I worked on. Um, you know, way back when I was a little kid coming up, I'm sure there was some some really old stuff. But the best thing that I can remember was a 1964 carrier split system air conditioner. This was at, and I don't do work for them anymore, so I can say who it was. This was at a Joe's Crab Shack in uh, Long Beach, California. It was right by the water. It's not there anymore. They've since closed it. But um, they had a an attic on top of the building, and it was a trip. It was a really old carrier air handler, but it had a Carlisle uh, 06D compressor inside of the air handler. So the compressor was in the air handler, and then it had a remote condenser on the roof. And it was a 1964 carrier air conditioner system, and I changed it out. But it was a trip because taking that thing apart Oh my gosh, it took us like three days to cut that thing into pieces because the, the building was literally built around it. It was so big. That thing was a, was a chore. And then the new one, we put in like a York air handler. Um, it was like a York, I don't know if it was the Predator line or whatever, but anyways, it was a York air handler with a remote condensed unit. It was like so much lighter and like so easy to install. So that was the oldest system I worked was a 64. So it was a very, very interesting system. Um, Oh, okay, so prime time. So someone had someone had posted a video. I don't remember who it was about a a Sporlin suction dryer. I think they may have posted something on Facebook or something like that. I don't know. Someone did, and it was about a biflow dryer that, that like a check valve broke off in, inside or something like that. Um, I've had good luck with their stuff. Haven't had any bad luck. So again, to each their own. Um, all right, keep going into here. See, someone manufactures good, some tools. Yeah, exactly. So some manufacturers are great. Some are just eh, so-so. Okay, I um, want to get to some questions that I have written down on my thing. Um, again, I want to cover that, and I'm going to pop up a screen share again real quick for just for shits and giggles to let anybody else that just came in here know. We did announce the winner of the Sporland uh, BQTEV kit, and it was Ryan from Grant Mechanical. Uh, so Ryan from Grant Mechanical was the winner of the Spoilin BQTEV kit. So I will get that shipped out to him. And again, I posted on here for those of you that entered that didn't win. Don't worry. There'll be plenty more giveaways coming. So we'll, you know, I'll, I'll work with some people and try to get something. I want to try to give back to you guys. Cause I really appreciate the time that you guys take to watch these videos. And, uh, it's very humbling to have the conversations that I do with you guys, whether it be through the chat or through emails and different things. Um, you know, I'm just a, a simple person, just a normal service tech. Uh, I make mistakes just like you. My shit smells the same as yours. I'm, I'm no different, okay? I just have had the opportunity to pick up a camera, and I'm able to film my mistakes. So I just like to share the little bit of knowledge that I have with you guys, and, and I'm super humbled by the amount of you that watch these. Um, 
videos and watch the channel. You know, uh, the subscribers, I'm, I'm blown away by the subscribers that I have right now. You guys are killing me here. Uh, we just broke 21,100 subscribers. Like I'm so blown away by that. It still just humbles me to think that, you know, uh, pretty much a, a year ago, I started making these videos to share with my technicians. And then now you guys are all watching this. So thank you guys so very much. And I hope to share, continue to share the knowledge that I have with you guys. Okay. So thank you guys very much. Um, Hey, Joel, how you doing, bud? Okay. Uh, Ralph, uh, when do you know it's time to change the sensor on your detect detector? It'll tell you, uh, when the sensor, it, it has a, a life, a life expectancy on it. It's based off of so many hours of runtime, but, um, it'll start flashing like some funky lights. You got to read the instructions, but basically you turn it on and it flashes like the battery's dead, but the battery's not dead. And, uh, it tells you that the sensor's bad. So we keep one of those sensors at the shop They're, I don't want to say a hundred bucks or something like that. So something in there. Hey, you want to know something interesting? I heard this has nothing to do with HVAC, but I heard that uh, Disneyland, which is a trip. I was watching something. Disneyland has an official policy right now here in Southern California where they're completely banning smoking within the park. No smoking within the Disneyland park. And the other thing that blew my mind, if any of you have ever been to Disneyland, is they're banning oversized strollers. Again, has nothing to do with HVAC. I just thought that was an interesting fun fact because if you've ever been to Disneyland, ever, I mean, even when I had kids, we would take the biggest stroller we had and load it up with an ice chest and food and everything. And they're banning those. And they have like size restrictions on strollers now. Uh, like when you're going to the airport with your carry on luggage and stuff. So I thought that was funny. All right. Um, let me see what else, what else am I missing here? Okay. So, um, again, thanks so much to Sporland. Okay. So someone had asked me what I use to, Sorry for the squeaking from my chair. Someone asked me what I use to find the liquid level in a liquid line uh, receiver. Okay. I've said it a bunch of times. I'm not going to tell you guys what to use, but I use a heat producing device. Okay. I just wanted to cover this a little, you know, clearly and make it clear. I use a heat producing device, whatever that device is, it's got to be hot enough to get the metal hot. You wave it up and down the receiver. Some people have asked me, can you use a torch? Can you use a heat gun? Can you use a hair dryer? All these different things. As long as it gets the temperature hot enough so that you can, you, so that the outside of the receiver gets hot enough, then, then you can use that. Okay. I'm not going to tell you guys what to use. You got to use your imagination, but I will tell you that I am not going to go get my oxyacetylene torch and bust it out to heat up a receiver. I'm definitely not doing that. Okay. So, um, but whatever you use, you got to be cautious to make sure that you don't overheat the receiver or overheat the soft plug. Uh, Dimitri, thank you so very much, dude. All right, let's keep going in here and seeing what I'm missing. You guys got any more questions, throw them down in the bottom of the chat, and I'll get to them, okay? Um, Ryan, you you know, hey, to each their own, bud. I'm, I'm, I'm going to say that there's people in this chat that, yeah, they've hit the nail on the head on what I use, but I'm not going to say it. You guys, I live in California. Come on. You got to be careful. California. We ban everything, and we sue for everything, so... Um, yeah, ban selfie sticks for whacking people on the rides. Yeah, that's a Disneyland thing too. So, uh, okay, let me go back up in here and see. Oh, right on, Just Russ. Cool, Disneyland Hotel. Interesting, huh? All right. And see what else I got in here, guys. Throw some more questions down in here and I'll get to them, okay? Anyone use the spin flare for drill bits on Trend, thank you so very much. I really appreciate these. These super chats are awesome, guys, because they really do help me with this streams. You know, it, it's totally, oh, Thanasis, really, really appreciate it. Okay, refrigeration P-traps, gotcha. So refrigeration P-traps, the point of a refrigeration P-trap is to speed up the velocity of the refrigerant to potentially catch the oil. This is a standard non-inverted P-trap, okay? So it's there to speed up the the velocity of the refrigerant and hopes that it's going to catch the little oil droplets inside the evaporator coil. So if you think about it, if uh, for whatever reason we have an evaporator coil that the refrigerant oil has left the compressor, 
um, flood back, anything, wash the oil out of the compressor, right? And it's made its way down to the evaporator. The problem is, is that sometimes the velocity, the flow of the refrigerant isn't fast enough to put that oil back up, especially if we have a really high riser. So the riser is the, the vertical section going straight up, right? If we have a really high riser going up to the roof, we could have a hard time, or maybe the oil will make it like halfway and then it'll drop back down because the velocity slows down. So we have some creative ways of speeding up the velocity of the refrigerant, okay? Um, if we follow, uh, and there's another, this is actually gonna segue into something else, but if we follow the manufacturer's instructions on piping the system correctly, we can do some things. So we can put a P-trap down at the evaporator or at the vertical riser. It doesn't necessarily have to be in the evaporator. It could be just at the vertical riser, okay? Um, going up, and then if we, um, Dizzy Dallas, thank you so very much. I really appreciate it. And then if we, uh, um, we can put an inverted trap on the roof, that's also going to help to speed up velocity, but then also help to not let um, refrigerant oil back down the suction line, okay, in an off cycle. Uh, we can also downsize the suction line on the top of the P-trap as it's going up to help speed up velocity. So there's a couple different things we can do, but the whole point is to get the oil back in the compressor. Now, in a perfect world, on a perfectly engineered system, what they're gonna do is they're gonna install an oil separator at the uh, up on the, co uh, the condensing unit, essentially, okay? So that way the discharge line coming out of the compressor, uh, the if there's any oil in it, it goes back into the compressor. It, it basically runs into the oil separator, separates the oil, and just puts a uh, you know vapor refrigerant to the condenser essentially, and then you know turns it into a liquid and follows the process. So um, what you want to do, if I would highly suggest, uh, I brought it up last week. I'm going to take off my headphones and grab a manual, and it's going to explain some things. For a really quick, easy read, I just went over to my bookshelf. I brought this up last week. Get yourself the old school Honeywell. I'm sorry, uh, Copeland refrigeration manual. It's going to give you a, uh, a cliff notes version on, uh, sizing refrigeration lines. Okay. And if you open up this manual, essentially, this is the book right here that I showed you guys last week, the Copeland refrigeration manual. This is a very, very old manual, uh, from the sixties, but this one was revived, revised in 1986. This book right here, part four, is going to tell you system design, and it's going to help you to design suction line risers. I actually had this all the way back in trade school, and you can actually see that I marked the tabs because when we were doing our refrigeration load calculation and system design class, we had to use this. Nathan, so very much, man. Uh, thank you so very much. I really appreciate all these super chats, guys. You guys are blowing my mind. Um, so get one of these books, and it's really going to help you. Now, what I, what I wanted to segue into is leaning on the manufacturers and following the manufacturer's installation instructions. So what you guys can do is go to Heatcraft, heatcraftrpd.com, okay? You can go to um, uh, Russell Condensing Units. You can go to Tecumseh Condensing Units. What I keep in my van is the refrigeration systems manual from Heatcraft, okay? This refrigeration systems manual tells you how to size suction lines. You know, um, I... If I, if I, I'll try to do a video on line sizes guys, and we can break this down a little bit more, but this, um, oh, there you go. Ralph from Honeywell says that they've got a line sizing calculator in their Gentron's product soft property software. So good, good information there. Okay. It's always good to have a manufacturer in the chat cause he can leave information. So, uh, you can get all this information from Heatcraft's website. Okay. And the same thing goes for, I have an old Copeland condensing unit catalog has all kinds of great information in it. Tecumseh, you know, I mean, everybody has their catalogs. All you got to do is search their, their websites and they have all kinds of good stuff in there. Okay. So, um, if you guys have more questions, I'll get to them in a second. I'm going to show you guys one more thing inside the chat. Uh, one thing I want to show you, let me go ahead and, uh, display capture and follow over. Um, you guys can go to spoilinonline.com. They have a literature section. If you guys go to the literature section, you guys can find all the information uh, that I told you, the pressure regulating valves, it has the head pressure regulating valves inside there. You can find all kinds of good information and it's downloads. You can download on your phone, your tablet, whatever you're using. Okay. The next thing I want to show you is if you go to heatcraft.rpd.com, same thing. They have a literature tab. You go to literature, you go to technical bulletins, miscellaneous. Uh, you can find the, uh, 
quick response controller information. This engineering manual is like the, the refrigeration Bible. It tells you to do load calculations by hand. Uh, it'll pop up here in a second. It's taking a second to load. Um, but it'll tell you how to do refrigeration load calculations and everything. So I'm going to go ahead and turn that off because that's taking too long to load for whatever reason. Their website's taking a while. But um, yeah, heatcraftrpd.com, and you can learn a lot more about that stuff, okay? So keep an eye or, you know, look, look into that stuff, guys. All the information that I share on, uh, on my streams is just information that I looked up from the manufacturers, guys. It's not some magical information that I know that nobody else knows. I just know where to look. Read. That's all I do is just read manuals and learn. So, okay, let's see. Uh, yeah, everybody has great information. So Ralph from Honeywell in here is saying, he, you know, like I said, he's got that uh, line sizing calculator and their Gentron's property software. Honeywell also has great information on their refrigerants and different stuffs. All you got to do is go to their website. If you guys have questions, reach out to Ralph. Ralph's in here right now. He, he, Ralph, you can put your email in here if, if you want to give it out to people. Um, anybody that wants to ask him questions about Honeywell refrigerants, okay? Ralph is the one that turned me on to the R448A that I'm using in my condensed units lately. So, uh, no, Jason, I did not go to Brownson. I went to Mount Sac, Mount San Antonio Community College in Walnut. Um, if anybody's familiar with that class, there was a lot of really great teachers. Mr. Darrow Soares, uh, Lanny Richardson, John Lane, lots of great teachers that worked at that school. And uh, I learned a lot from those guys, so... Um, okay. Keep right manual. Yeah. Everybody's got great information. You just need to know where to look for it. So, ah, Ryan Tanner, business advice. How many hours labor do you think should be charged for an ice machine cleaning and sanitation? Uh, depends on the ice machine, but if we're talking a Hoshizaki machine, it's going to be minimum four hours, um, four to six hours. If it's, uh, just a normal dirty machine. And then sometimes more, if it's like stupid, stupid, dirty. Uh, Manitowoc ice machine, about the same. It's going to be four to six hours for a cleaning. Uh, I don't care what the installation instructions say. That's what I'm quoting. And, uh, that's what we're going to do. If it's two machines, it's going to be an all day job. And, uh, we quote it that way. Um, you know, I do ice machine cleanings a little bit different than most people. Okay. Uh, one of these days I'll do a video on how I do that, but essentially I have a giant Rubbermaid bucket. Um, again, because this came up, I don't have pictures or anything. I'd love to give you guys some visual aids, but I buy a Rubbermaid bucket. That's about 18 inches tall. Uh, you know, the ones that have like lids that you store crap in, you know, I just throw the lid away or sometimes you can keep the lid, but I keep brushes and like cups and different things in there. And, uh, we take that Rubbermaid bucket, we fill it up with half a bottle of ice machine cleaner and some hot water and you disassemble after you've ran cleaner through the ice machine, you run cleaner through the clean cycle one time, then you disassemble the entire machine and put all the parts into that Rubbermaid bucket and let them soak in there. And then you do a scrub down on the ice machine while you're waiting for those parts to soak. Once you've done a scrub down on the ice machine in a perfect world, I've emptied all the ice out of the bin. I take a hot water hose and I've got that with me and I'm spraying as I'm scrubbing. Once you've done that, clean the underside, then you disassemble the parts. Um, if the machine was emptied out, which, which is really how it should be done with no ice in it, then I'll use the ice bin as a sink and take the parts, open the bin door, take the parts and rinse them off in the ice bin. And then that way, you know, and then put them into a clean whatever and then run sanitizer through the machine. Once you've ran sanitizer through the machine, then you put it back into normal operation. So that's gonna take me typically four to six hours. All right. Um, okay. Uh, Superior, you're asking if AC restart from new Calgon, is it good or bad for converting an R22 unit? Okay, I don't wanna talk crap about new Calgon. I, I don't want to be a basher, okay? If you guys choose to use their products, then more power to you, okay? I don't choose to use those products, okay? Um, I don't know if, I don't even think it was new Calgon, but there was a, uh, there was a refrigerant manufacturer out there. I don't remember who it was. They made a can of um, something that you added to the system so you didn't have to vacuum it down. That's where they really lost me. You sprayed this in the system, like on a mini split, you sprayed it into the system and it supposedly took all the moisture out of the system and turned it into a solid and made it get stuck in the dryers. Uh, but then now that I said that it wouldn't work on a mini split because mini splits don't have dryers, but whatever this crap was. Okay. I don't buy into those gimmicks. All right. In my opinion, again, to each their own, but in my opinion, you don't add any of those things to the system. Okay. Look, if you have a refrigerant, and Ralph, I hope I'm not stepping on your toes here, okay? But if you have a refrigerant 
any of the new refrigerants, they're only meant to be used with polyester oil, okay, or the PVE oil. They're not meant to be used with mineral oil anymore, okay? So any of these R22 replacements, yes, they will, they have like, they will do okay with mineral oils, all right? But they always have a disclaimer in their paperwork that says for best, you know, operation, best results, use it with polyester oil, okay? there's not anything you can do to that system besides mixing, adding extra oil and different things to it. Okay. In my opinion, that's going to make it work right with the refrigerant. If you want to solve your problems, don't add any of that stuff to it. Just change the oil in the system and call it a day. Then you can use any refrigerant you want. All right. Don't be trying to use one of these refrigerants that is meant for POE, but it works okay with mineral oil because you're going to run into a headache. Okay. There may be those very small opportunities that it might work. Okay. But uh, I have some great examples of systems that didn't work, okay? And they were, and I learned quickly after the fact, I had used a refrigerant, um, don't know who makes it. I don't know if you make it or not, Ralph, uh, R427A. I don't think you do. I think 4A makes it. But anyways, R427A um, was a refrigerant, and it was told to me by the supply house that it works fine with mineral oil. I had a train 3D scroll system. It was a... It was a 20 ton system. I think it was a 20 ton or an 18 ton system, two compressors in it. Uh, what had happened was I converted the refrigerant over at, well, first off it had a refrigerant leak. I, um, repaired the refrigerant leak, vacuumed down the system, changed the liquid dryers, installed the new R427A, charged it to the proper superheat settings on the package unit. And a day later I had a bad compressor. Okay. So I went ahead and replaced the compressor, put the same refrigerant back in. No, you know what? No, I didn't change the compressor a second time. That's right. Okay, so so I take that back. What happened was uh, I fixed the leak. The compressor was still working. Put the new oil or put the new refrigerant in there, and then the new compressor died. So I called it a fluke. Maybe it ran so long without oil. So I put a new compressor in there. Then the new compressor died a day later. What I figured out was that the refrigerant doesn't work well with mineral oil, Okay. And on a trained 3D scroll compressor, they need that oil coming back on the suction line to lubricate the upper bearing on the compressor. The way that the system works is, is the oil travels with Jason Yeager. Thank you so very much, dude. So the way that that system works is, is the oil travels with the, um, with the refrigerant and it comes back and lubricates the top bearing, at least my understanding is, on the 3D scroll compressors. And what was happening was that oil wasn't returning back with the, the, the mineral oil. I'm sorry, the, uh, the, yeah, the, the mineral oil wasn't returning back to the compressor with the, um, the refrigerant essentially. And we basically killed the compressor two times. Okay. Um, now was it the fault of the refrigerant? Not necessarily. I mean, a refrigerant's a refrigerant, but had I read more information and followed more of the manufacturer's instructions and not so much listened to the supply house that said it works fine, just put it in there and you'll be fine. Uh, then I would have figured out that you don't do that. Okay. And, and, um, Ralph, maybe you can, I don't know if you know anything about this, but I've, I've heard several refrigerant manufacturers have said that their, their, um, quote unquote drop-ins, which there really isn't a drop-in, but the R22 replacements don't work well with train 3d scroll compressors for that reason, because they don't have very good, um, the oil doesn't return very well with the refrigerant. Now, some of the refrigerant manufacturers, again, I'm kind of stepping out of my comfort zone as to how I'm educating right now, but I have heard that some of the refrigerant manufacturers will add the hydrocarbon refrigerants, if my understanding is correct, to these replacement refrigerants, and that's what helps with the oil return. So they add more hydrocarbons to help it. I could be totally off basis on that, so I want to be careful because I'm not a refrigerant manufacturer, but that's my understanding. So anyways, uh, to answer your question, I'm not a fan of any additives that we're adding to the system to help it work better. Just not a fan. They just don't work. I wouldn't use them if I had a choice. So, okay. Yeah, maybe it is that dry R crap, Bill. I don't know what it was, but it was like you dry something in a can. It was stupid. Very stupid. Uh, I'm glad you agree with me, Ralph, and I didn't step on your toes with the stuff that I was talking about. So. Hey, Scott, thank you so very much, man. I really appreciate it. Okay, so uh, Joel Manegro, what is the chemical and sanitizer I use to clean an ice machine? Um, right now, I'm really, really digging the Refrigeration Technologies ice machine cleaner. Um, is it, oh, what is it called? Is it called Viper? Let me pull it up right now. Um, but, and then I just use the Honeywell SMS, uh, IMS sanitizer is all that I use. 
Um, so, Refrig Tech. Let me look this up real quick. I'm going to pull up the refrigeration technologies. Yeah. So, Refrig Tech, and they have an ice machine cleaner that they sell. And let me pull this up, and I will pull it up right now. So, it's called the Viper Nickel Safe Ice Machine Cleaner by Refrigeration Technologies. I'll go ahead and share this. Okay. So, uh, Refrigeration Technologies, this is the stuff I'm digging right now. It does a really good job, and it's uh, nickel safe. Uh, but it doesn't have citric acid in it. So it's also safe to use on the Hoshizaki ice machines. That's a whole tangent we can go on, but you got to be cautious about using nickel safe ice machine cleaners on Hoshizaki. So be very careful about that. But um, yeah, so the Viper nickel safe is what I'm digging right now. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this off. Transition back. There we go. See, I'm getting a little bit better at this streaming thing. One of these days, I'll show you guys my setup. I got like a little tablet right here that's like a remote control that I can operate OBS with. I know I'm not great at this, but I'm learning. Um, Heather Crombie Zombie. I do primarily refrigeration, correct? Yes. Um, yeah, it is. Time and materials is what we bill for commercial. Commercial refrigeration is time and materials. Our customers wouldn't go for a flat rate charge. So uh, they just don't. All right. Guys, if I missed any of your questions, throw it back down in the bottom, okay? I'm just kind of going into here. Uh, Susie, I saw something different. I don't want to talk crap on anybody, okay, again. Um, but I see Blue On popping up everywhere right now. And uh, I would like to see some more documentation because they're coming in strong right now with a lot of claims. And I just, but I could be totally wrong. I, I Again, I don't want to talk crap on someone, but I, they're just, they're, there's so many claims and there's so much money behind their commercials and different things. I'm a little leery about the Blue On stuff, but prove me wrong. Send me information. Let me read about it. I'd be happy to talk to someone about it. I'm just not a fan in these weird replacements. So, guys, I'm going to be honest with you. I've told you guys before. I'm going to give my customers the option, but I I am still selling R22. I, it's still in my van. I, if, if, I, if I have an old R22 system, until I can't sell it anymore, I plan on selling R22. And my customers are totally on board with that. They understand the refrigerant costs. I ask them at the beginning of every summer season, are you... And, and hey, Ralph, maybe you can enlighten me a little bit more because I know all these new California rules and different things. I don't know what the legitimacy and what the legalities are of using R22 refrigerant still. So maybe you can send me an email, Ralph. I'd love to talk to you some more about that. Um, but yeah, I still use R22 refrigerant because I'm not a fan of any of these replacement gases. OK, I just just not a fan. So um, no count count senseless. I'm sorry. I, it takes me a second to pronounce your your username. Uh, I have never worked on any ammonia systems. I have seen uh, Ulysses Palacios uh, on Facebook uh, post about the the ammonia systems he works on. And uh, I wish he was making videos because he, he still does some Facebook videos. But you guys, Ulysses used to make the coolest compressor videos. I don't know if you're in here, Ulysses. Are you? I haven't seen you yet. But he used to make the coolest compressor videos. He was one of the people that inspired me to start making YouTube videos. There's a couple of the guys out there, NorCal Dave and Zach, you were one of them. And, you know, uh, Ralph Wolf was one of them. I mean, there's a bunch of different guys that were making videos and gave me the inspiration to make them and watching all those guys. And Ulysses was definitely one of them. Um, okay, guys, for, uh, for, for anybody that's asking, Nicholas is act asking right now. So I did announce the Sporland giveaway. Uh, the winner was Ryan from Grant Mechanical. Ryan from Grant Mechanical won the Sporland giveaway. And uh, for those of you, I've already announced it already, but for those of you that didn't win, um, there'll be more stuff coming soon, okay? Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to try to reach out to a bunch of manufacturers and see, because if I can give them free promotion and they can send me free products, hey, what the heck, why not? So let's do this and let's get you guys some great stuff. So that way, that was this, and that's what I kind of already touched on anybody that just came in here, was this Sporlin kit. This was just me reaching out to Sporlin and saying, hey, I want to make a video promoting your product. Would you be interested in sending me one of your products to give away? They're, they're not paying me to give this thing away. They just sent me the kit. So, you know, uh, there's 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 nothing there. They just sent me the kit to give away. So hopefully I can do that with other manufacturers soon. All right. Um, let's see what else I got going on here. Yeah, commercial refrigeration and stuff. R22 is pretty expensive. It's not 700 here, though, dude. R22 is... Uh, while I'm talking... I will look it up right now, but yeah, it's not 700 here. Um, it's, I, I'm not going to spend a bunch of time looking that up right now, but it's, it's definitely up there, but it's not 700 yet. Um, okay. 
Let me see what else I got. Ah, prime time. Most mechanics, I don't know if I'm if I'm stepping on something, a conversation you're having, but I really do. Oh, okay. Uh, Hayden Heath, I'll get to that question right now. Don't let me forget it. The 502 replacement refrigerants. Um, so prime time says most mechanics don't know about proper placement of a solenoid valve. Yes, that's that's a good point. Um, depending on how you're using it, if you're using it as a pump down system, it's best if you go ahead and use it as a pump down system, uh, put the solenoid valve, either install the defrost clock downstairs. Okay. Cause you typically don't want the compressor shutting off without the solenoid valve. Um, also you, uh, I think even more so than placement of a solenoid valve is proper sizing of a liquid line solenoid valve. I try to bring that up in my videos a little bit. You don't size a solenoid valve by the line size. Okay. It is not unheard of to have a half inch line size solenoid valve on a three eight system, depending on the tonnage of refrigerant that's pushing through that valve. Okay. Depending on the type of valve. So, um, what I would highly suggest is go to that Sporlin online and just read their document on solenoid valves. It tells you how to do it. It's really not that hard. It tells you to take into consideration the pressure drop and different things, but it's really not that hard if you read, uh, the, the, the manual. Okay. So, um, Let's see, Ralph. Yeah, let me, I will do that for you, bud. Hold on just a second. Let me see if I can post Ralph's email address here. I've got it right here in my phone and see if we can get you guys some information. If anybody has Honeywell refrigerant questions, Ralph is the man to help you out with. And hold on just one second. Oh, thank you very much, Ralph. I really appreciate that, bud. Um, let me pull up, see if I can figure this out. I'm a little difficult here. Okay. So I'm going to type this out real quick and it is Ralph dot Vergara Vergara. Sorry guys. I'm slow when it comes to this stuff at Honeywell dot com. So if you guys have questions, let me make sure I spelt this right. It's uh, R E L P H. Ooh, yeah, there I got it. Period. Vergara at Honeywell.com. If you guys have questions, uh, you guys can uh, email Ralph. He can help you guys out a little bit when it comes to the refrigerant stuff. Definitely help you there. Uh, Christian Cruz, how you doing, bud? All right, uh, Jason Arnett. Yeah, Ulysses is great. There's a lot of great, great people out there on YouTube. NorCal Dave is a great guy too. Super Tech. Yeah, that 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 song was funny. So. Yeah, NorCal definitely gave me a lot of inspiration so uh, to do these. Okay, guys, if you got more questions, let's throw it into the chat, um, and I'll try to get to these for you guys here. Oh, uh, R502 retrofits. Well, 502 is a pretty old refrigerant, man, and the problem with the 502 was they were using mineral oil on that, okay? So that creates a problem with doing a retrofit on the refrigerants. So um, 502, unless you change the condensing unit, you're going to need to change the oil in the system, okay? Uh, there is some drop in replacements like such as 408A, but I don't know the, wh which one of these refrigerants are being banned anymore because 502 really isn't a, a, a refrigerant that's very common out there anymore. Okay. I'm sure Ralph has some of them that can work some of these drop ins and different things. Um, but your, well, your best bet was to use 404, but 404 is being phased out too. For those of you guys that aren't in California, you may want to consider getting jumping on the bandwagon and phasing it out quicker because our laws do affect everybody else. So California passed a state law on new installations, no 404A refrigerant anymore, uh, and they consider a new installation a compressor, expansion valve, or, or uh, evaporator replacement. Um, so uh, we are using R448A now is our refrigerant that is replacing R404A. So um, you may want to lean on uh, email Ralph that I, I put his email in there, um, and uh, he may be able to help you out with a refrigerant. That might be a drop-in replacement possibly for R502. I don't know which ones exist out there. Um, but in in the best world, change your condensing unit, change your metering device. If you if I mean, I would love to see you change the evaporator too, but if you can't, condensing unit, metering device, and go ahead and convert that refrigerant over. Um, uh, but if you if you uh, just with the metering device, you also have to change the the orifice or the um, in the in the expansion valve or even the distributor head too. So um, yeah, be cautious about that. So all right, yeah. 448 should work, but you're going to have a pressure drop problem across the nozzle 
or the orifice in front of the expansion valve. So you're going to have to change the nozzle. I've been doing a lot of reading about that. And uh, going from R22 to um, 448A, we still need to change that nozzle because we have a pressure drop problem. Sometimes you can get by with using the valve. The expansion valve can still kind of half-ass get you by. But in a perfect world, you're going to change the expansion valve, the nozzle, and the condensed unit on the roof. I mean, you might as well change the evaporator too, but if you can't, you, you can get away with just that. Um, understand you're going to get more efficiency uh, with the R448A out of your evaporator, but you're going to have to derate your condensed unit. So you're going to have to go with a bigger condensed unit on the roof. I've just been doing a lot of retrofits lately and doing a bunch of research on this, so that's why I know this. All right, let's see. Zach, uh, the power head will need to be, but we usually will change the TXV, yeah, typically. Um, okay, let's see what else I'm missing in here. Uh, one shot by i -Core. Yeah, there, there's some of those those drop-in refrigerants. Just be careful with the oil return on those things. So, um, What else? Okay, sounds like I told my company to change them because they haven't been having complications with walking in the Yeah, you got to change those nozzles, Zach. Um, or uh, maybe you're talking about changing the power head or whatever, but... Um, okay, so Ryan Tanner, uh, changing filter media every month or bi-monthly for a refrigeration PM? You have customers both ways. That's a good question. You know, I mean, it really depends. Um, okay, so, you know, with some customers, they can get away with bi-monthly every other month or quarterly stretching it for a filter media. But another thing I'm going to bring up to you, like we find, is that we have a customer that we do filter media monthly for. And what we tend to find out um, is a lot of stripped out screws taking the covers off because we're in and out of there every month. And uh, for whatever reason, people don't know how to use uh, uh, a drill. They don't know how to use the clutch on their drill or they're constantly using their impacts and they strip everything out. And then what I find is, is I go out to do a service call and panels are missing off of condensing unit covers and different things like that. So um, if we can do our job right, then I say every month is a perfect situation because filter medias actually do create a pretty big pressure drop across the condenser and they can cause problems. So, you know, there's even some manufacturers that don't want you to use a filter media, but I would argue that one. But yeah, so in a perfect world, I'd love to change them every month. All right. Let's see what else. Let's see what else. Yeah. Hey, guys, I really, Jesus, thank you so very much. I really appreciate it if you guys go hit the thumbs up button on the video. It really does help with like the search rankings and different things to get the information out to other people. Uh, YouTube basically helps to recommend this video to other people when you guys get that thumbs up. Any kind of interaction really helps out. So really appreciate it. Um, ah, Zach Perez. So I had kind of covered this a little bit a minute ago, but I'll cover it again. So what do I think about using dye to locate a leak? Not a fan of dye. I'm not going to lie and say I've never used it. I've used it two times. On, I can still remember the systems. Um, I will say that I have systems. The two systems I have used it on, uh, I haven't had any real repercussions other than it being messy and nasty, okay? But um, I'm not a fan of putting any additives or anything in the system. Uh, if, Zach, if you haven't already, I just released a video Sunday night, just like a quick like two-minute video, um, and I showed a walk-in evaporator coil where the previous company to me had put dye in the system, and the customer called me for a second opinion, not knocking the company because they were recommending the evaporators be replaced and they were trashed. They needed to be replaced. But what was really interesting, Zach, was that um, it had dye in there. So I had my UV light because I have it in my van. I, I used my UV light and I found two leaks with the dye, but I found another leak because I used my electronic leak detector also. I found another leak with my electronic leak detector and then put soap bubbles on it, big blue uh, soap bubbles, and it was picking up another leak that the dye wasn't even showing. So I thought that was really interesting that, you know, and so again, I'm, I'm not going to knock you guys for using it to each their own. I said that earlier. Okay. Um, you guys choose to use it, go for it. Just understand there could be repercussions and it's also going to be messy and it's going to contaminate everything. So dye is just a mess. So if you can get away without using it, I highly suggest it, but you know, you guys do your thing and you guys got to make those informed decisions on your own. Um, let's see. Haha, <laughs> that's funny, Jesus. It's funny how that works. All right. Yeah, I mean, you know, the the sister, the two times that I used dye again, they were absolute last resort, and the customer was totally aware of it. It was it was for a leak that we were having a hell of a time finding. It was a multiplex system that had a crap ton of evaporators, and we just couldn't find the leaks. And the dye did work, but that system is forever messy now. 
So it's forever messy. Um, right on. Yeah, I really appreciate people hitting the, the thumbs up button or the like button. It'll really help. Um, so John, that's a great question. John Dashney asked me when I sell time clocks, do I try to sell electronic over mechanical? Um, I use two, typically two time clocks. I use the Paragon 814520. That's my most common time clock along with the Graslin DTAV40. Typically or currently right now, I'm not using like the Paragon digital clock or anything like that. Okay. Um, I'm going to tell you that I, I don't prefer either one of those clocks over the other whether it be the Graslin or the Paragon. Both of them serve a purpose for me. So they're both a mechanical clock, all right? Um, if I can, I'll install one of the Keto Therm Temp Plus Defrost controllers that has the defrost built in. But if I'm working in a really sandy place, like where we get a lot of blowing sand, and I do some work up in Barstow, California, where it's out in the desert, uh, I, I don't like installing Graslin clocks because the Graslin clocks, they get gummed up with sand, Okay. But um, I prefer to use a Graslin clock for the ability to put long defrost in the middle of the night and short defrost during the day. When you work with the Paragon clocks, in my opinion, as long as you keep the terminals tight on them, they tend to have a really good life expectancy, okay? But um, you can't do different defrost at different times. Now, I do realize that Paragon's digital clock, you can do different defrost times, okay? I just haven't jumped on the bandwagon with the Paragon digital one. Um so, you know, I, I typically just use those two clocks and then uh, just kind of go from there. The one other thing I like about the old mechanical Paragon 814520s is that um, you can actually pull the clock out of the housing and safely energize the system and look at the timer motor to see if it's working properly, too. So you don't have to sit there and watch the clock for two hours to see if it tracks and keeps time. You can just look at the timer motor to see if it's failed. So, you know, uh, that, that's the two clocks that I typically use. All right. Um, let's see what else I got going here. Ha ha ha. All right. Ha ha. Alex Zapata. How do I feel about piercing valves on reaching coolers and reaching freezers? Interesting. We just had this conversation with one of our techs today. Um, piercing valves. Piercing valves serve one purpose for me. Okay. Um, they're they're junk, and I throw them away, and I don't like them. But I will use a piercing valve on a system that I'm throwing away, and I just need to recover the charge out, and I don't want to waste the time brazing on fittings. Um, but if I go work on a sealed system, I have a vice grip style pinch off tool. I take the process stubs on it, pinch it off, braze on a fitting while it's still under pressure, then release the pinch. And then, uh, that's what I use. I don't like using the mechanical piercing valves. Um, the other instance, like for instance, the other day we had a service call on an R290 system and we knew that, uh, the system had a bad low pressure. Well, it, the low pressure control was open. Okay. And my technician was there and we just needed, so we knew the low pressure control was open, but it was sealed. So we didn't know if there was refrigerant in the system. So I had him add a piercing valve because I knew we were going to come back. Okay. And, uh, I wasn't concerned about, um, it, it's not going to leak that much. So I wasn't concerned about it leaking out, but I just didn't want him to waste the time. So in that particular situation, we knew we had a bad low pressure control. We didn't have us have it on us, and I didn't want him to spend any more time than we needed to. So I had him add a piercing valve to the suction side just to verify if there was pressure. There was pressure in the system. So we made sure that the piercing valve wasn't leaking, just did a quick leak check on it. It wasn't at the time, and so we just left that on the system. But I'm going back. I just got the pressure control today. I'm going back, and we're going to cut that piercing valve out. The reason why I don't like to use piercing valves is because if you've ever taken one apart, the only thing that prevents a refrigerant leak is a tiny little sheet of rubber, and it's just compressed by the mechanical fittings of the piercing valve. Okay, so it's just a little tiny piece of rubber is the only thing stopping all that refrigerant from leaking out of that fitting. So piercing valves always leak. So I will tell you right now, don't ever leave a piercing valve on a system because I guarantee you will go back for a leak on that system. So um, let's go see here. So I see Bill Burnett saying I use the S-Man 480 now. Let me go up to Pablo's comment. Ah, so Pablo, you said, do I use the S-Man 460? I have an S-Man 460, but for the last pretty much year now, I've been beta testing the S-Man 480. Uh, it's going to be released anytime now. They're, they keep saying the spring, so it should be have a release date anytime. And uh, so I've been using the S-Man 480. It's a really, really cool manifold. It's not op or out for the general public yet, but it will be soon. 
Um, it has wireless capabilities, all kinds of cool stuff. But yes, my spare manifold now is an S-Man 460. So I still have an S-Man 460. I have the S-Man 480, and then I have uh, I-Manifold manifold, and then also uh, some compound gauges with just stubby fittings on them. So, Okay. Reading down in here. Yeah, Andrew, I don't know why I haven't jumped on the bandwagon with the 9145. I know a lot of people love that. It's uh, Paragon's digital clock. I just haven't. And and I guess that's a good idea too there, Daryl, because it keeps the time in case of a power outage. That is cool. Um, Sackman do sounds like a good way for you to get a free kit. I don't know what you're referring to on that one. Did I miss something up in the comments there, bud? Um, let me see if I missed anything up in here. Flat rate doesn't work for commercial, does it residential? I don't know what the context is to that comment there, Sackmandu. Um, how good is the S-Man 460? Pablo, the S-Man 460 is a great manifold, man. And, uh, you know, I have had some problems with it, and I took it back to field piece, and they would just take care of it. Like, the problems that I had was it was my fault on the S-Man 460. One time I had something floating around in the sight glass because I put it on a dirty system, and there was, like, something floating in there. And field piece just swapped it out for a new one for me. They were really cool. Uh, one time I dropped it, I was like totally not expecting it, but I went in there cause they're local to me and just said, Hey, uh, yeah, these things aren't working. And they were like all smashed up and they totally gave me a new set. They were, their field piece is really cool. I'm not saying you're going to get the same exact results, but I've heard nothing but great things about their warranty policies. So rubber dries out. Yeah. Rubber dries out on those, those fittings. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay. Yeah. Trevor. Good. Yeah. There you go. Uh, again, another plug for Sporlin. Read Sporlin's document for for changing 404 to R22 to 448. Yeah, I did read that document. It was very interesting to read that. So, um, let's see what else we got. Okay, Joel Monegro, what tools of promotions of your company you use for new customers? Uh, Joel, honestly, I don't. I am not the best person to ask about business stuff. Okay. So I am a business owner. I co-own this company with my father. Um, but honestly, we, we, we only have, we're, we're extremely lucky. I realize that. And you guys are going to hate me for saying this, but we don't advertise at all. We've only been word of mouth business for the last 30 years. Okay. So we, we had one really good customer that was from a friend and then that led to a million other customers and over the years and different things. So we've always been word of mouth. I do have my name on the side of my van and I do have a website, but I, I don't get anything from my website and I don't get anything but phone calls about people driving too fast from the name on my van. So we don't have any advertising at all. So I'm not the best person to tell you about promotions and different things for customers. Um, okay. Pablo, is it good to pressurize and vacuum? Yeah, you, you need to vacuum. Um, what I would highly suggest, especially until you get comfortable with the system, well, you always need to flow nitrogen when you're brazing. Okay. But, um, I always highly suggest you doing a pressure test before. And then also, are you talking about, um, Oh, Pablo, you're asking about with the, with the manifold is what you're asking, huh? Um, yeah. So the S man 480, I got to tell you guys. Yeah. The toast people, my office is a bit bland. Yeah. It does need some lava lamp. Um, this is just an office in my, my house. It's just a very, very small little room. Um, so Pablo, one thing I got to say guys about this field piece, S man 480. one of the really cool features that I think is kind of, well, you guys will all see it when it comes out is they have a tightness test. So it's a really, really cool. Um, and I know Testo, I think does something like this too, but it, it's a tightness test that you basically take the suction line clamp off the manifold, put it on the suction line and it does a pressure test and compensates for the temperature change inside the system and tells you, you know, how much of an actual pressure change you have, um, keeping in mind the temperature change in the system. So if you're doing a long vacuum on a system and you're leaving it on there overnight, or even during the day, I've seen temperature changes on the suction line as the sun comes out and heats it up. Um, nitrogen, a lot of people have a misconception that nitrogen is an inert gas. So meaning that it doesn't change pressure via temperature. And that's actually incorrect. Nitrogen is not completely inert and nitrogen does change 
pressure via temperature. So if the temperature outside rises dramatically, the pressure of the nitrogen is going to, uh, you know, rise or fall depending on the temperature change, whether it be high or low. Okay. So, um, the field piece S man 480 has that tightness test to where it looks at the suction line pressure. You put the temperature clamp on there. And then even if the pressure goes down like one PSI or one and a half PSI, it may not register as any change because it's also looking at the temperature change in the system, okay? Um, as far as using the micron gauge, it does have a micron gauge built in on the S-Man 480, and so does the S-Man 460, but the S-Man 460 doesn't have the tightness test. But um, I'm not a fan of using the micron gauges inside the manifold. There's a time and place for them um, on very, very small systems sometimes, but typically I like to connect just my hoses with vacuum core removal tools and a, a, a micron gauge attached to one of the side ports on the vacuum core removal tool, and then the hose is going directly to the vacuum pump without a manifold. So that's, I don't like to use my manifold to vacuum if I can. All right. Um, <laughs> Jesus, house and gun tour. I live in California, man. You can't know the guns that I have. I can't, I can't make them publicly known. Um, okay. Huh, that's funny, Susie. Yeah, my office, guys, is very boring. Watch. Very boring. There's my bookshelf. And, yeah, that's pretty much it. Nothing more to my office. And there goes the, that's what I get. Still a little crooked, but it is what it is. Um, okay, guys. I really think... Oh, I imagine so. Commercial refrigeration and stuff. I've heard a lot of people using CO2. I know my, my camera's still a little crooked there. but um, Guys, I think that we are going to wrap this up. Um, Nathan, you asked me any thoughts on or experiences using the Sporlin electronic expansion valves, key to therm versus Sporlin regarding electronic expansion valves. Um, I have never installed a new electronic expansion valve besides what came in the systems. A lot of the ones that I've seen out have been the Corel uh, electronic expansion valve. So I have no opinion about the Sporlin expansion valves. I can't really say whether I like them or not. Um, the key to therm systems that I had, I I'm pretty sure it had a Corel expansion valve on it too. I don't think it was Sporlin. Um, but yeah, I haven't done the new installs, so I haven't had a lot of problems with them. So I really have no opinion on that one at this point in time. <coughs> Superior, my dog is, uh, uh, outside. My kids are home right now. So normally while I do this stream, actually my kids just left, but normally, or one of my kids did, uh, normally while I do this stream, my daughter goes to singing lessons. Um, but she had a later start today. So my youngest daughter usually stays home with me and my wife takes my oldest daughter. So whenever my uh, youngest daughter's out in the front room and I'm in the back room, I always make sure she has the dog with her just because the dog will protect her a little bit better. All right, guys, um, I'm going to wrap this up. I really, really appreciate you guys uh, giving the video a thumbs up. And uh, you guys send me emails if you have questions. It's hvacrvideos at gmail.com. I really, really appreciate you guys coming in here. Thank you guys so very much. We're going to go ahead and wrap this up. And I will, uh, like I said, send me emails and I will catch you guys on the next one, okay?